Hello everyone, welcome back. So, for the past few months, I've been dealing with university students who are taking physics courses, uh, despite doing majors in other subjects, for example, students from engineering background who need to do introductory physics courses just to have an exposure on topics they'll probably be using but they don't need to have a firm grasp on those topics like physics majors do. And even though they have seen a lot of these topics um, in their high schools, they never really understood what exactly we have been doing. And a lot of people just simply want to have an idea about the basic structure of introductory physics courses especially, uh, for example, mechanics, like the topics that I have written here, right? So this list is an example of the syllabus of a lot of introductory physics courses across many, many universities. And from a physicist perspective, these are very basic topics. I wouldn't say fundamental. They're very basic and easy to comprehend. But I've seen a lot of people, uh, a lot of engineering students, struggles to comprehend the basics of these topics. Uh, so what I wanted to do uh, originally, and uh, still would like to do that as well, is to give a fast-paced review of these topics. And simultaneously, I also would like to show them the map of physics, like how everything comes naturally and fit together, like dovetailing puzzle pieces. So I'll start with the basic mechanics and then we'll go on to explore different topics. And I'll basically put them together on a playlist so that people have everything together, uh, ready for them or they want to review what, everything they have learned so far. So whatever you'd like to do, this is basically a short, uh, fast-paced, uh, yet comprehensive review of the basic topics in physics that people might be interested in across the spectrum. So let's start. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the concept of units. Basically, we like to measure things in physics, and physics is nothing without the measurement. After all, physics, at its core, is an experimental subject, and it like to measure things. And in order to have measuring scales, we need to use units. Basically, we use uh, two unit systems. So the most uh, popular one is the SI unit system, which is also called MKS unit system which is basically an abbreviation of meter, uh, kilogram, and second. But in experimental physics, uh, people often use the CGS units as well, right, uh, in the basic laboratories, if you're not doing any specialized topics. And CGS stands for centimeter, gram, and second. So this is CGS, right? always always stick to the proper unit system because if you don't then problem arises and experiments can fail or if you are involved in uh, large projects you can have catastrophic consequences so that's the unit system once you have selected your unit system uh, then obviously you want to find out what kind of quantities they are so we also have the idea of dimension right and this is intimately related with the unit system as well uh, see in mechanics for example everything can be dubbed or constructed in terms of mass uh, length and time right so basically the things that you see here characteristically uh, and categorically they can be constructed off of these three objects so m is mass l is length and t is time obviously you can introduce other quantities as well because there are seven fundamental quantities in physics uh, in terms of which everything else can be constructed so every time you take in some other aspects so for example if you want to introduce 
uh, thermodynamic you want to consider temperature right and then probably you use theta for that and so on and so forth but for basic mechanics we just need m l m t and so quantities uh, that have basically the same dimension uh, often they are the same quantities but sometimes they're not so a big difference is for example the concept of work and torque that we'll be talking about uh, they both have the same dimension but they are different quantities very very different quantities and have like remote connections but they are not the same thing then we go to the type of quantities that we'll be dealing with one type is scalar they're basically quantities that are sufficiently described by a number along with a unit but there are quantities which have geometric properties and they are called vectors and numbers and units are not enough they also need direction so number unit and direction now obviously if a quantity needs to be described by direction it doesn't automatically qualify for a vector so if you talk about current for example uh, we often indicate its direction by an arrow right but it doesn't necessarily act as a vector although there is another notion of current density which is a vector uh, but that's not our concern so in order to be a vector not only does it have to have the property of direction but also it needs to be added geometrically so addition subtraction uh, everything that is to be done has to be done in terms of geometry so that means 5 plus 5 will not always make it 10 you we'll also have to consider its geometric orientation to give you the results so it can be anything from 0 to 10 right and there are more information that need to be uh, asserted in order to specify uh, the result so number unit direction and geometric property right geometric property all of them have their own examples and we will be specifying the nature whether something is scalar or vector the nature of the quantities as we go along some properties of vectors need to be explained so for example you can take any vector and add another vector by the triangle rule or the polygon rule so for example uh, you have two vectors a and b if you complete the polygon then the vector you complete it with uh, will be the sum of all those vectors so in this case it's a triangle and so this vector here uh, signifies the resultant vector a plus b but you can have more than two vectors so for example this is a this is b this is c this is d right so let me write a b c d and you complete it with a vector that originates from the original point of the first vector and ends uh, at the final point of the final vector and this vector will indicate the resultant vector which is a plus b plus c plus d and you can extend it as much as you want an equivalent way of adding the vectors is to follow the parallelogram rule so for example if you have a here and instead of drawing b at the end you draw b at the same point b and uh, the resultant would be the diagonal of the parallelogram these two vectors create so this will be b this will be a not very super sharp drawing but i think you have the idea obviously uh, the vector if it needs to be described fully will uh, have to have its magnitude and its direction so for example a vector's length is a representative of its magnitude so uh, like if i draw a vector like this 
it can only be a representative or be an actual vector so if it's a position vector it's an actual vector but if it's for example electric field then obviously the electric field is not so long it is confined to one single point so the length we draw the vector with is just only a representative however there is a notion of the magnitude which can be linked with the length of the vector sometimes so magnitude is written by the vector itself and then uh, two bars uh, by its sides or just simply the letter of the vector itself and uh, its orientation is given with respect to some reference line so for example if you want to find out the magnitude of this resultant vector a plus b then you need to know the angle between the two original vectors right uh, and uh, their own magnitude so for example if you know the magnitude of a which is written as a and the magnitude of vector b which is written as b then the resultant has the magnitude a plus b uh, double bar which indicates the magnitude and it will be written as uh, it will be given by this formula a squared plus b squared plus 2ab cosine of the angle in between a and b which is written here as alpha so we write alpha right so this is the formula for the resultant and the direction is denoted by this angle it makes with one of the vectors let's speak a for example and the angle between a and the resultant vector is theta then we can write tan theta equals uh, b sine alpha divided by a plus b cosine alpha one important aspect of using vectors is to have the concept of unit vectors so basically unit vectors are those vectors which have uh, the magnitude of one so for example if you have a vector a and if you divide it with this magnitude uh, then this vector a hat uh, will be a unit vector right if you want to find that its magnitude its magnitude is basically one the physical significance is that a unit vector signifies a direction only because it has magnitude one so it has nothing to contribute apart from a direction so any vector can be written as its magnitude a times the direction also uh, the concept of opposite vector or negative vector is uh, given by just the opposite orientation of the same vector so for example if this is vector a then negative a would be a vector of the same length uh, but in the opposite direction right so for example if you want to subtract a minus b then it's just simply the addition of two vectors where the second vector is the opposite of b vector right and it holds many laws for example the addition is commutative although the subtraction is not that's pretty obvious if you multiply a vector by a number you just get a bigger vector so for example if you multiply it by two so you get a vector which is twice the length uh, of the same vector right so this is a plus a and that the whole vector is basically twice a now we have added uh, different vectors we know how to add two vectors and find out the magnitude of the resultant and its direction but we can go in the opposite direction as well so for example if you give me a vector a and ask me to decompose it into two different direction then it is entirely possible so geometrically it makes sense uh, to decompose it into two directions by this process basically you get 
the uh, contribution on this line here, which has made an angle alpha with the original vector by uh, drawing the other line or the other direction through the tip of this vector, right? So for example, like this. So then this would be the component here. And similarly, you can have the other component along this direction, right? And let this angle be beta, right? So let this component be called a alpha and this component be called a beta. And we know the directions of a alpha and a beta, but what are the magnitudes of these components? So the magnitude of a alpha can be found very easily by using the sign law of triangles. But uh, let me just write it for you anyway. So it will be a times the sine of beta divided by sine of alpha plus beta. What about a beta? That will, I think by now you have understood the pattern. This will be a of sine alpha divided by sine of alpha plus beta. Oftentimes we want to resolve a vector into components which are perpendicular to each other. So for example, this can be x-axis and this can be y-axis and there is a vector right here which is a b vector and we want to find out the x component and the y component. And obviously in this case alpha plus beta will be 90 degrees and so bx is going to be b cosine alpha where alpha is this angle here and b y is going to be b sine alpha see we don't have to specify the other angle because we have done that through this constraint here so here you need to have two pieces of information and you need to do that here as well despite the appearance of having to specify one angle because the other angle is specified through the constraint you have imposed right here. Now a little ago we introduced the idea of having a new vector from an old vector just by multiplying it with a scalar number. So for example some a. Now this new vector is a times bigger than the previous vector uh, which is just simply this a right that's easy to make sense now uh, that's not vector multiplication right uh, this is sometimes called scalar multiplication but uh, vectors can be multiplied among themselves in some sense it's not exactly uh, like the multiplication of two scalar numbers but they are in some sense the multiplication of two vectors. Before I speak of them I'd like to specify is that since I'm trying to give you a an overview I'll probably not be talking about a lot of geometric consequences and uh, the possibility of uh, doing this different operations in different coordinate systems what I'd like to do is to specify a Cartesian coordinate where uh, all the axes themselves are oriented uh, 90 degrees with respect to each other. So for example, if this is the X axis, this is the Y axis and the Z axis, uh, then things become a lot easier. So everything we'll be uh, talking about from now on will be done through this uh, Cartesian coordinate system where everyone is perpendicular with everyone else, right? So in that case, a vector can be decomposed into three different components. Uh, unlike the previous time, I have shown you uh, how to resolve a vector into two components. Now it will be three. So one will be AX times I hat plus AY. Y is the subscript times J hat uh, plus AZ. Uh, times k hat. Uh, 
but I'll be using different symbols instead of i hat, j hat, and k hat. I'll be using x hat, y hat, and z hat. So ax x hat plus a y y hat plus a z z hat. In some books, uh, y hat uh, is written as x two hat, uh, x hat is written as x one hat, and z z hat is written as x three hat. But uh, we're not going in that direction unless it is absolutely necessary for us to do so. The magnitude of this vector in terms of these coefficients can be written as follows. So the magnitude of a vector is the square root of ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared. All right. This is the magnitude. Now, the vector products themselves. So there are two types of vector products. One is uh, the dot product, dot product, uh, where we, in some sense, multiply two vectors to get a number, a scalar number, right? So if you have a vector and b vector, you can dot them, right? And this will be a number only. All right, or a scalar. Uh, it's better to say a scalar because uh, it will have units. So number plus units, the attributes of a scalar quantity. If two vectors have an angle alpha in between them, so let this be vector A and this be vector B, and the angle between them is alpha, then the dot product is given by this formula where we have a, b, cosine, alpha, all right? And we can clearly see from this formula that this dot product is a symmetric operation, all right? So a dot b would mean the same as b dot a with nothing changed. Now, this is an important part to observe because later we will have a product system which will not be symmetric, rather it will be anti-symmetric. And what that means will be understandable within a few moments. But if we do have a Cartesian coordinate where we can express A and B in the following way, so first we write A equals a x x hat plus a y y hat plus a z excuse me a z z hat similarly we can write b as b x x hat plus b y y hat plus b z z hat then the dot product between the two objects can be defined as follows so a dot b equals a x b x plus a y times b y plus a z times b z so how do we know that this is the result it is done by the knowledge of the effect of dot product on the unit vectors. So, uh, for example, if we have i hat dot i hat, according to the formula that we have prescribed above, uh, their magnitudes are 1, so it's 1 times 1, and the angle in between them is 0 degree because they are the same vector, so it's cosine 0 degree, which is 1, so it's just 1. But funnily enough, if you have i hat dot j hat now something interesting happens uh, the magnitudes are the same as before each having the magnitude of one but now the angle in between them is 90 degrees which is zero and zero times one is zero so this is zero and this goes on uh, for all other combinations so for example uh, if you have j hat dot j hat uh, and k hat dot k hat you have the same result, of course, in our language, it's going to be x hat dot x hat uh, equals y hat dot y hat uh, equals z hat 
dot z hat uh, will be one and uh, any other computation for example x hat dot y hat uh, or y hat dot uh, z hat uh, or z hat dot uh, x hat is going to be zero so you do that uh, for our vectors here and you get this result right you also have other advantages so for example remember uh, we wrote down the formula for the magnitude of a vector so a uh, written as a x x hat plus a y y hat plus a z z hat right and uh, you can take a dot a which is simply a x squared plus a y squared plus a z squared which is the square of the magnitude so this or sometimes written as simply a squared this here is also sometimes written as a vector squared which is a misnomer because it looks like it's a vector but actually it's the dot product of two vectors which makes it a scalar uh, you can also find out uh, the angle between two vectors so for example if you know the result of the dot product of two vectors let's say you know the components and then it's easy to find out the dot product of those two vectors then just by dividing the multiple of the magnitudes the product of the magnitudes uh, you get the cosine of the angle in between them right so vectors are very easy to work with once you have uh, prescribed a coordinate system this is especially true for the next topic that we'll be introducing which is the other type of product that can be possible to construct between two vectors and that my friends is the concept of cross product I hope the spelling is correct cross product so if you have two vectors uh, that are decomposed into components in a coordinate system so a x x hat plus a y y hat plus a z z hat right and b equals b x x hat plus b y y hat plus b z z hat then the cross product between these two vectors can be written in terms of a determinant and that determinant is written here so first we write x hat y hat and z hat and then we write the components of the first vector here so ax and then ay and then az and then we write the components of the next vector uh, bx by and bz and we know that the determinants are anti-symmetric when we exchange two rows or two columns so this is the same as negative b cross a and if we expand this determinant uh, what do we get we get um, a y b z minus a z b y times x hat plus so on and so forth and uh, I write this only to emphasize the fact that this product results in a vector unlike the previous product where two vectors came together to produce a number in contrast with this case where two vectors are combined to produce a vector now uh, if you don't want to write uh, the result in terms of a coordinate then it's possible to also have a coordinate free definition where 
the magnitude of a cross b is given by the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b and sine alpha where alpha is the angle between them so if a is a vector uh, and b is a vector right uh, the magnitude is going to be the area enclosed by the parallelogram uh, constructed by these two vectors what about the direction of the resultant vector the resultant vector which is a cross b all right let's call it c vector will be perpendicular to the plane these two vectors have constructed so sometimes this direction of the c vector is drawn by this which is entirely misleading rather we, since uh, these two vectors are confined to this page uh, the perpendicular direction would be outside of this page so a cross b its direction would be out of this page which is drawn like this right so this is to emphasize or denote the tip of an arrow so imagine a an arrow is coming out of this page uh, what would you see you would see this uh, whereas if you had taken b cross a that would go inside the page uh, and you would see the tail of an arrow which would look like this right so this is this one is outside of the page and this one is uh, inside of the page right and uh, this is dictated by the right hand rule the rule is basically you put your right hand uh, along the first vector uh, in such a way so that the palm faces the second vector and then you'd curl your fingers and you'll extend your thumb and your thumb will direct uh, the direction of this vector C or rather the resultant vector so that's uh, basics about this vector uh, now that we have that knowledge we can readily start the mechanics of single particles